Joining us right now with more on Disney's leadership and the road ahead is Jeff Sonnenfeld. He's Senior Associate Dean for Leadership Studies at the Yale School, School of Management, and he's quoted on the Vote Disney website as saying that the Pelts Proxy Contest is motivated by all the wrong reasons. Uh, Jeff, just want to make it very clear whose side you're coming down on on this. In the last week, we had a couple of, um, of people who kind of voiced support on the other side, supporting Peltz's proxy battle on this. We want to give you the opportunity to talk about why you think um, it's not a great deal for shareholders. Uh, th thanks, Becky. I, uh, I, I don't have any consultation uh, relationships or any uh, any entanglements with Disney. Uh, not that they offered, but I, I don't have any uh, completely conflict free. But what I would say is that uh, there's been a lot of misguided information coming across in the last couple of days. It basically, you, you look at the storming of the Magic Kingdom, you have a, a genu genuine wizard with, with Bob Iger, and then you have a, a an illusionist with, um, uh, with Nelson Pelz with the sleight of hand. And if there are two things that people take away from, from our, our, our chat right now, it's, yes, uh, as your introduction said before the break, uh, is that Iger's uh, performance has miscalculated. It's up 554%, returning $200 billion of shareholder value through his term. They just shouldn't count the Chapek years, his successor, and that's what Belts Peltz does is confusing. And the second piece of information is that Peltz is in a disastrous form. He's desperate, and he's circling the drain. The uh, Peltz, basically, it's the Peltz candle as it melts. He's he's uh, struggling, and this is desperation vendetta drive uh, as his last, last flicker of the flame. And uh, if you take a look at what he never wants to talk about, is that uh, over the course of his holdings, 68% of his holdings like, like, uh, are down more than uh, considerably. They're, they're way down on, on the S&P. And uh, the list of companies that he never wants to talk about are, you know, Kim Troy down like almost 60%, and Unilever, GE, Janus, uh, Family Dollar, uh, MSG, Wendy's, uh, BNY, uh, Mellon, uh, Mondelez, uh, his first shot at Leg Mason. These things are way underperformed the S&P. He's a net destroyer of value. And instead, he just creates all this noise distracting uh, by trying to throw stones at others. There is a piece in the Wall Street Journal. It's actually on the front page of the Wall Street Journal this morning, taking a look at, at Tryon, his firm. It says that they've been losing money, that, uh, comp that investors have been pulling money out in recent years. Points out that from 2019 to 2023, Tryon's cumulative return on the flagship investment fund was 59%, and that the S&P 500, by comparison, was up 87% over that period. But Tryon does say that since its inception, it has outperformed the S&P 500. Well, that's just not true. You look at company after company or an aggregate. This is why Disney uh, pulled out of their pension fund, which is part of the vendetta here is that, uh, uh, as Disney complained uh, several, a couple of years ago when they pulled out back in 2021, that at that point, over eight years, they were, they were getting more than 5% below the S&P. And what the Wall Street Journal points out, and uh, you're right, that piece should be a little bit surprising to Jim Stewart and the New York Times, is they're pointing out that Peltz is, is the funds are, are collapsing. He's had to shutter his, his, his UK uh, uh, European fund, uh, he's he's down 40 percent if you don't count the, the the money that his friend Ike Permatter just put in. He's down 40 percent in his own investors, and his, his son-in-law quit or or was fired or pushed out. Ed Garden, who was who was the number two, and uh, and is coming on air with David Favor to talk about how the model's not working. On and I think that's um, that's quite telling. And so this is this is a guy who's also tried 25 times, 25 times to get on this board. That's pretty desperate. And you look at Iger's performance; he's up six percent, uh, you know, uh, just uh, you know, in the first year. But actually, he's up twenty-two percent up till now. As we've gone a little bit further, as you know, in just one day alone last month, he was up twelve percent. Is as for somebody who comes back in in a turnaround, I've classified them as generals. The Second World War was a, a great triumph of returning generals. Is uh, Steve Jobs was that kind of person, and Michael Dell. Michael Dell's stock was. Was, was way down. He was down around 17% his first year. He soared since, of obviously, and as uh, Howard Schultz came into Starbucks, they were down about 48% the first year, and they're fantastic turnarounds. And of course, he soared in three years, but it takes three years for these turnarounds to work. And Iger, 
his stock that he's up compared to Jobs, compared to Dell, compared to Howard Schultz, uh, that he's he's up 22 percent is astounding. Hmm. Hey, Jeff, persistence is something that sometimes pays off. In fact, this piece from the Journal today uh, gives one of Peltz's personal Ten Commandments, according to quotes that his family just made for his recent birthday. And that quote is, just make a pain in the ass of yourself. They don't teach persistence in business school. What happens if Peltz is um, elected to this board by the shareholders? How, how will the company work with that? It's a dripping faucet. It's a big distraction. He, he, his, his big tool is not financial returns. He's a net destroyer of value. So he gets away with, uh, can be charming at times, uh, as we all know, but it's, he gets away with bullying and uh, bravado and, uh, uh, and a, uh, a lot of bluster. Uh, but uh, despite that locker room talk, that's what a board has to put up with. So they they try to create somebody at one company at Mondelez. They created an alternative CEO just to absorb his time and attention. But you, you talk to people on the board of, say, of Procter & Gamble, which did do well while he was on the board, one of the few. Yeah, and that's despite him. That's because he, he, he suggested moving the headquarters from Cincinnati. They asked him why. He said, I don't know. And he said, we should move M&A down to the division level. He had no suggestions. They, already the co company was on the right course, and he was on the coattails of that. Same at PepsiCo. They did well by not listening to him. He wanted to break up. You remember this, international Pepsi from domestic Pepsi. What a kooky idea. That's when Hilton Hotel split themselves apart years ago. It was a disaster. And then he also wanted to, to staple together his, his losing Mondelez business, which has been terribly performing under him, uh, and, and put it together with Frito-Lay. Well, that, that, that was crazy. So they just ignored him. And huh. that's how they, they did well.